if Jesus has lifted you up this week, say amen. amen. Ah, hallelujah. Boy, we have had some kind of revival meeting. And uh, we praise God for it. And we're just looking forward to what he's going to do tonight. I want to tell you, Brother Bob and I had a great time of fellowship today. And, and God just began to lay some things on my heart that we need to do, and, and um, I shared those things with him, and it, he, he's involved with it, and uh, so you'll be hearing more, but there's going to be a lot of things that's coming out of this revival meeting that I think that is going to be a tremendous uh, blessing to the Lord's work here in this area, and so, um, but we, we're thankful for that. So let me, let me just um, again thank Brother Bob for being here. Uh, Brother Bob Pittman, in case this is your first night here, uh, Brother Bob Pittman is vocational evangelist from Muscle Shoals, Alabama. He's been here six, this is the sixth time that he's been at Sweetwater. And so one of the things that he's expressed to me um, over and over again this week is just his appreciation for this church and how he's thankful for this church. And, um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for him. Grateful for the word of God that has been shared here with us this week. And we pray for the Lord to bless this time uh, tonight. And you pray for him. Let me mention one announcement, and that is regarding next Wednesday night. Next Wednesday night, of course, we're going to be having church Sunday. But next Wednesday night, we're going to be having a children's rally. And it's going to be for grades 1 through 5. There will be no adult meeting, no youth meetings that night. It will be all children's rally. They're going to take over the place. That's dangerous, isn't it? Uh, there will be some adults here with them. But they're going to take over the place, and they're going to have a, a rally in here. They're going to have pizza afterwards for grades 1 through 5. And if you go to a different church than Sweetwater, uh, we encourage you to get your kids and bring them here. We're extending that invitation to whatever church wants to bring a group. And so um, we put out that information. And so that's next Wednesday night. It's going to be a great time. I believe the, uh, the kids are going to lead out in worship. Some are going to lead out in worship. And then um, we have a guest speaker that's going to be coming from the Louisiana Baptist Convention. He's a children's specialist there. So it's going to be a great, great night. Um, and so you be praying for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then uh, Brother Larry is going to make his way up here. We'll give him a few seconds to get up here. No, I, I appreciate Brother Larry, don't you? Uh, amen. He is, uh, he is no doubt in pain, but God has enabled him. He has enabled him to be able to do what he's done this week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your enablement. Lord, we are nothing without you. Father, whether it be physically, we're nothing without you, but spiritually, we're nothing without you as well. Father, we are lost without you. We have no hope without you. But thank God in Jesus, in Jesus, we have life. We have abundant life. We have eternal life. And Father, I pray if, if there's anyone in this building tonight that does not have that secured, that they know that they're going to spend eternity in heaven, I pray that tonight will be the night that that decision is made, that commitment is made to you. And then, Father, for believers that are here tonight, for those of us that know that we're saved, God, I pray that you would just breathe afresh upon us tonight through your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 The chorus says, at the name of Jesus, Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This has been such a good week. Let's stand together and let's just sing this to our Lord.
Thank you, choir. Before brother, brother Bob comes, let's just lift up the Lord, the majesty and glory of your name. Let's sing it together. Here at Sweetwater, you really don't have a great choir. It may be the greatest choir in the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm telling you, there's just not many like this bunch. And tonight they sang my favorite song, This Blood. Thank you for doing that on kind of short notice. It blessed my life. I have enjoyed being here. Now, this is my sixth time in the last 14 years to come and be with you. 
And maybe the Lord will let me come back again someday, but I have certainly been blessed. I have received much more than I've given. And I thank you so very much. Your pastor can sleep well tonight because you've been faithful to this meeting. It is easier to be the evangelist in a revival than it is to be the host pastor. It is. Because the host pastor, he has the real burden of the meeting. Are my people going to come? Are my people going to pray? Are my people going to give? Are my people going to invite others? And, and uh, you've been so faithful this week. And in spite of COVID, in spite of the threat of storms, we've had a wonderful, wonderful crowd every night. And I just commend you so very very much. Next week, I'll be in Boonville, Mississippi in a revival. The week after that, I'll be in Tuscaloosa, Alabama in a revival. The week after that, I'll be in North Carolina in a revival. But it, I don't get over places like this quickly. I wish they were all like this. I really do. But they're not. They're not. But this is one of my absolute all-time favorite places to come. Sometimes, sometimes people ask me, Brother Bob, are there some places that you really like to go more than perhaps other places? And I have to say yes. And uh, this is one of my top-of-the-list places, and I love coming here. You say, now, Brother Bob, you say that everywhere you go. I promise you I don't. I promise there are some churches, my favorite view of them is the rear view mirror as I drive away. <laughs> but uh, to be here in this place is, and I hope you don't take for granted what you have here. This is the kind of church the devil would love to bust up. But just don't let him, okay? Well, the first service of a revival and the last service of a revival are always the two most difficult for me. The first service of the revival is there are some folks who've never seen you before and they're going to make up their mind if they're going to come back or not. And then the last service of the revival, you think of all the things you've preached and all the things you'd like to have preached. And, and uh, you come to the last night of the revival and about 15 sermons you'd love to preach, but you can't. And so I'm going to share with you what I believe God's laid on my heart for this final service tonight. Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. John, chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 21. John, chapter 8, verse 21. <coughs> if you have found it, Say amen. amen. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. And then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, you cannot come. And he said unto them, You're from beneath, I'm from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. I said thereun, therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I'm he, you shall die in your sins. In these verses, Jesus is speaking to a group of Jewish Pharisees. Not all Jews were Pharisees, but all Pharisees were Jews. They were a particular sect within Judaism. They were very, very strict in the things that they taught and in the things that they believed. But the Pharisees of that day are like a lot of folks of this day. They had a lot of religion but they did not have a relationship with God. Christianity is not a religion. I don't care what they teach you in school. Christianity is not a religion. Buddhism is a religion. Hinduism is a religion. Islam is a religion. 
Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so there are a lot of folks who are very religious, but they don't have a real relationship with the Lord Jesus. The word Pharisee means to be separate or to be separated. And these Pharisees lived what they called a separated life. There were certain foods they would not eat. There were certain places they would not go. There were certain things they would not do. And there were certain people they would not hang out with them. And because they had separated themselves from these things, they thought that made them right with God. But just because there are foods you don't eat and places you don't go and things you don't do and people you don't associate with, that does not make a person right with God. And in the separated lives they were living, tragically what had happened was they had really separated themselves from God. And that's sad. They had substituted religion for relationship. And so Jesus is talking to those Jewish Pharisees. He's not talking to his disciples. He's not talking to a group of church folks. <coughs> He's talking to those Jewish Pharisees. You know, when you think about the words of Jesus, when you read the New Testament, sometimes his words were heartwarming words. For example, in Luke chapter 24, which is Luke's account of the resurrection, Luke tells us that early that Sunday morning, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But the tragedy was most people did not really believe it. Even those who had been following him and walking with him for months, many of those who had been his followers, they just did not, they could not believe that he had risen from the dead. They saw him crucified. They saw him die. They saw him buried in the tomb. And the idea of someone who's dead and buried coming back to life, they just, they just couldn't believe that. And so on that first Easter morning, on that resurrection day, according to Luke's gospel, many of those who had been walking with him and following him began to walk away from Jerusalem and go back to their homes. Two of those men lived in a town called Emmaus. Emmaus was seven miles away from Jerusalem. And on that resurrection morning, they walked away so discouraged, so despondent, so sad. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jesus begins to walk beside them. Now, they don't recognize him. The Bible says their eyes were holden. That means that God did not allow them to recognize who he was. And Jesus walks with them and he says, why are you so sad? And why are you talking with such gloom? Why are you so down? And they said, well, sir, did you just get off the bus? Don't, don't you know what's happened here in the last few days? There was a man by the name of Jesus, and, and we, thought, we thought he was going to be the deliverer of Israel. We thought he was the one. But they took him. They spit upon him. They slapped him. They crucified him. And they laid his dead body in a tomb. Oh, some said this morning he came back to life, but we just, we just can't accept that. And the Bible says Jesus began to teach them out of the Old Testament as they were walking home. He said, have you never, have you never read in the Old Testament prophets that the prophets said that when the Messiah comes, he's going to suffer and he's going to die and he's going to be raised again? And he just had a little Sabbath day, a Sunday school lesson with them on that Sunday morning. They come to the borders of 
the place where they live in Emmaus. And Jesus was going to walk another way. And they said, please come, please come stay with us. And Jesus said, I can't do that. Well, well, come have supper with us. And Jesus said, all right. And Jesus goes to the house where these two men live. And the Bible says that he took a piece of bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And all of a sudden, when they saw him break that bread, their eyes were opened and they recognized who it was. And the very second that they recognized who it was, he vanished. Now, I don't mean he got up and walked out of the room. I mean, he just disappeared. He vanished. He had come out of nowhere to walk with them, and now he disappears into nowhere. And this is what they said. They said, did not our hearts burn within us? as he opened to us the scripture. You see, sometimes the words of Jesus are heartwarming words. Sometimes the words of Jesus in the New Testament are life-giving words. In the sixth chapter of John, there was another day when many of the folks that had been following him began to walk away from him. And Jesus turned to the disciples and he said, will, will you also go away? And they said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Life. And so sometimes the words of Jesus are heartwarming words. Sometimes the words of Jesus are life-giving words. And sometimes the words of Jesus are encouraging words. You think of how many times Jesus said, Be of good cheer. Fear not. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Man, those words encourage you. Why, well, you'd, you'd attack hell with a water pistol after that. Amen? I mean, they just encourage you. And so when you read the New Testament, sometimes his words were heartwarming words. Sometimes they were life-giving words. Sometimes they were encouraging words. But the words that I've read for you tonight, these are not encouraging words. These are not life-giving words. And these are not heartwarming words. These are the saddest words Jesus ever spoke. You'd be hard-pressed to find anywhere in the New Testament where Jesus spoke any sadder words than these. The saddest words Jesus ever spoke. And let me tell you three reasons why, and we'll have our prayer. Number one. These are the saddest words Jesus ever spoke because they speak of a sad way to live. Down in verse 24, he says, For if you believe not. To live without faith is a sad way to live. Now, if you choose to live without faith, that's your business. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe the Bible. You don't have to believe in Jesus. You don't have to believe any of that. Nobody can force you to believe that. You have your own right and will to make a choice in those things. But if you choose to live without faith, I just don't believe it. That's your business. But I want to tell you, there are consequences that come with that decision. For if you choose to live without faith, it means you will not ever be saved. Never. If you choose to live in unbelief without faith, you cannot ever be saved. In the book of Ephesians, Paul said, For by grace are you saved through faith. 
Now, faith does not save anybody. Faith cannot save anybody. It is the grace of God that saves a person, but it is through faith that God's grace comes into a person's life. God's grace does not come into a person's life through water baptism. God's grace does not come into a person's life when they take the Lord's Supper. God's grace comes into a person's life when they put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And there's no other way to be saved. There's no other way that God's grace can get inside of you and save you. So if you choose to live without faith, that's your privilege and that's your business. But you won't ever be saved. Secondly, if you choose to live without faith, you can never please God. Hebrews uh, 11, 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, he didn't say it's hard to please God. He said, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. No matter how many good works you may do, no matter how much money you may give to worthwhile organizations, no matter how many acts of kindness you may show, if you're not trusting Jesus, there is absolutely nothing you can ever do or say or give that will ever impress God. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so if you think that you're going to go to heaven just because you're a good person, if you think you're going to go to heaven because you're a nice person, or you would give the shirt off of your back to somebody, I want to tell you, you're kidding yourself. Because apart from faith, it is impossible to please God. Tell you something else. If you choose to live without faith, and that's your privilege and your business, but you will never have a prayer answered. Jesus said, whatsoever you ask in my name, believing, believing that you shall receive. Prayer without faith is not prayer at all. It's just religious talk that means nothing. And so, to live without faith To live without faith means you'll never be saved. You'll never please God. You'll never have a prayer answered. And I tell you, that's a sad way to live. But these verses are not only the saddest words Jesus ever spoke because they speak of a sad way to live. They also speak of a sad way to die. Three times in these four little verses, three times, Jesus said to those religious men, you shall die in your sin. And friend, that's a sad way to die. What does it mean to die in your sin? Well, first of all, it means you have never experienced the forgiveness of God. I'm 74 years old, and I tell you, at this stage in my life, the Bible doctrine that is most precious to me and that I would fight for the longest is the doctrine of forgiveness. I am glad that God is a forgiving God. The word forgive is one of the most unusual words in the Bible. It literally means to send away. It means to take something that is here and send it somewhere else. And there are three pictures of it in the Bible. One place the Bible says that God has taken our sins and has put them in the middle of his back. Have you ever tried to see the middle of your back? Even an Indian rubber man can't turn his head that far. Another place the Bible says God has taken our sins and has cast them into the depths of the deepest sea. Now, I don't know where the deepest sea is. I'm sure there are oceanographers who know where the deepest sea is, and I know that God knows, but it doesn't make any difference. It's just a picture anyway. 
Another place the Bible says that God has removed our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Now I want to ask you, how far is the east from the west? There's absolutely no way to measure that. No way at all. Now, if he had said as far as the north from the south, you can measure that. You go out in front of this building with a compass in your hand and head north and just keep on a trucking. It'll take you a long time. But you keep heading north, eventually you'll come to the North Pole. And once you pass the North Pole, you're headed south. And just keep on going, follow that compass, and eventually you'll come to the South Pole. And once you pass it, you're headed north. You can measure the distance from north to south, but you can go to Monroe like I'll do tomorrow and get on an airplane, and you can start heading east, and you can circle planet Earth 25 times, and all you're doing is heading east. Or you can get on an airplane and head west, and you can circle planet Earth 25 times, and all you're doing doing is heading west. There's no way to measure the distance from east to west. And so, Brother Bob, which is it? Has God taken my sins and put them in the middle of his back? Or has God taken my sins and cast them in the depths of the deepest sea? Or has God removed my sin from me as far as the east is from the west? Yes. <laughs> Just pick one, doesn't make a bit of difference. It simply means that when God forgave you, he took your sin and sent them away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we sing choruses today in church a lot, and, and some folks think they've just been invented. But when I was a teenager, we sang choruses at the church where I went, grew up. And I can remember one of those little choruses we used to sing. You ask me why I'm happy, I'll tell you why. Because my sins are gone. To die in your sin means you've never experienced the forgiveness of God. Your sin is still in you and on you. It's never been taken away. Also, to die in your sin means that you die with no more chances to be saved. Do you know what some people believe? Some people believe that after you die, somewhere out there in the dim, dark, dismal future, somewhere God will come to you and give you another chance to be saved. After you die, you'll have one more opportunity. And so there are some people, they have the idea, I want to do what I want to do, have what I want to have, be what I want to be, go where I want to go, because it doesn't matter, because after I die, God will come and give me one more opportunity. And I'll jump at that. I'll take that chance. Now, folks, I want to tell you, there's not one thing in the Bible that even hints at that. The Bible teaches that when a child of God dies, their spirit goes to heaven. And the Bible teaches that when an unbeliever dies, their spirit is cast into hell. And there are no more chances after you die to be saved. None. And to die in your sin means that you die without any hope for heaven. I have to be honest with you. I'm looking forward to going to heaven. But can I be even more honest? I was looking forward to going to heaven when I was 16 years old. I've been looking forward to going to heaven a long, long time. This world is not my home. I belong, and hey folks, we've gotten ourselves in such a mess, Democrats nor Republicans are going to get us out of this. Thank God. We're aliens here. We're strangers here. We're pilgrims passing through to our eternal home. Hallelujah for that. But if you die in your sin, you have no hope for heaven. I've gone to funeral homes. I was a pastor for 33 years, I was a pastor before I became this gypsy preacher going from place to place. I know what it is to go into a funeral home and the person who's died was not a believer. Cared nothing about the things of God. Never went to church. Never trusted Jesus. Had no spiritual life at all. And yet when the preacher walks in, there are always some who want to 
who want to try to cover up all of that. Uh, preacher, now, now I know old Joe, he didn't, he didn't go to church much, but, but, but now, preacher, I want you to know Joe was the best old thing. Why, well, he would give you the shirt off of his back, preacher. Oh, he was such a good guy. Listen, I don't ever, I don't ever say to folks, well, you're just a liar. I may think that, but I don't say it. I'm a nice guy. But I want to tell you, you don't go to heaven because you're the best old thing. And you don't go to heaven because you'd give the shirt off your back. You can only go to heaven if your sin has been forgiven and Jesus has come into your life. No other way. And so if you choose to reject Christ out of your life, that's your business, but understand that if you die in your sin, you will never experience the forgiveness of God. You will never have another opportunity to be saved. And you will forever, forever regret that you missed heaven. And one last thing. These verses are the saddest words Jesus ever spoke. Because they speak of a sad way to live and a sad way to die. But also they speak of a sad way to spend eternity. Now folks, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. One fellow said, well preach, I think I'll just opt out. Nobody opts out of eternity. You're going to spend it somewhere. You are. Jesus said to those religious men, I'm going away. But where I'm going, you cannot come. And do you know what they thought? Do you know what they thought? Did you catch that little bizarre, strange, peculiar question there? When Jesus said, I'm going away, and where I'm going, you cannot come, they said, is he going to kill himself? Is he going to commit suicide? Is he going to take his own life? Do you know why they said that? Because the Pharisees believed that all Jews went to heaven just because they were Jews. And there were a lot of different kinds of Jews. There were Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodian Jews and Sephardic Jews and many other kinds of Jews. But the Pharisees taught that all Jews go to heaven just because they're Jews. And they said the only way that a Jew would not go to heaven would be for a Jew to commit suicide. Jesus was a Jew. And when Jesus said, I'm going somewhere and you're not going to go, they assumed that he was going to hell because they knew with all of their religiosity they were going to heaven just because they were Jews. But that's not at all what Jesus meant. Jesus wasn't going to kill himself. Jesus was going to heaven. I'm going away. And where I'm going, you cannot come. And if you don't go to heaven, there's only one other. There is no such place as nirvana. There is no such place as never, never land. There is no such place as purgatory or limbo. Those are figments of the imagination. If a person doesn't go to heaven, they go to hell. Hell is a place of pain. I don't like pain. You've seen the brother help me up and down the steps over there. I had this knee replaced at the end of January. Now that's eight months ago. And I'm still having a lot of problems. Larry had one knee done six weeks ago and the other knee done two weeks ago. And how he's done what he's done, I don't know. After two weeks of surgery, I was still wanting to murder my doctor. <laughs> I don't like pain at all. 
I'm not a friend of pain. But hell is a place of pain. The Bible says that it is a place of fire. A place of burning fire. All of us have seen fire in our lifetime. Maybe you saw a campfire as a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout. Maybe you have seen a grass fire. Maybe you've seen a house fire. But every fire you've ever seen, every fire I've ever seen, eventually stopped burning. Maybe it burned itself out. Maybe you put it out with the hose. Maybe the fire department came and put it out. But every fire you've ever seen stopped burning. But Jesus said, Jesus said, the fires of hell are unquenchable. Nothing can put them out. And for the person to be cast into the place the Bible calls hell to burn there forever and forever and forever and for I'm telling you, hell is a place of pain. Hell is a place of sorrow. Jesus said in hell there's weeping and wailing. Now we all know what weeping is. We all know what sorrow is. But do you know what wailing is? Have you ever seen anybody wailing? I've gone into hospital rooms as a pastor years ago <clears throat> after maybe a young person was involved in a terrible automobile accident. And I would walk in and see all of those machines attached to their bodies and I've seen grown men, the daddies of these folks, I've seen grown men over in the floor drawn up into a fetal position, screaming, Oh, God, no! Oh, God, no! That's wailing. That's wailing. And Jesus said the only sounds of hell are weeping and wailing. Nobody sings, nobody hums, nobody whistles. Hell is a place of sorrow. And it's also a place of hatred. Jesus said there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever hated something or hated somebody that just to think about them made you begin to grind your teeth? That's what the gnashing of teeth is. It's grinding your teeth. It's an expression of hatred. Hell is a place of hatred. There is no love there. One man said to me some time back, Preacher, I, I'll just be honest with you. I want to go to hell when I die. I said, Sir, I, 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 don't, I don't know how you could say that. Why, why would you say that? He said, I'll tell you why. He said, My daddy was the best friend I ever had. He was more than my dad. He was my best buddy. My daddy taught me how to drive a car, he said. My daddy taught me how to play ball. My daddy taught me how to drive a car. My daddy taught me how to be coy with girls. My daddy, he was my best friend and my best buddy. And my daddy hated preachers. I've seen my daddy bodily throw preachers out of the house. I've seen my daddy open up a Bible and tear pages out and blow his nose in those pages. I've seen my daddy get in the car and drive up to the church parking lot and use the bathroom on the church parking lot. And when my daddy died, my daddy died cursing God. And I know my daddy's in hell. But I want to see my daddy. I said, friend, I, I have to tell you this. If you go to hell to be with your daddy, you're going to make hell worse for him. Because he won't love you in hell. And you won't love him. Because all eternity you'll follow him around. Daddy, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Why did you tell me the Bible was a lie? Why did you tell me there was no God? Why did you tell me to live without faith and without Jesus? Daddy, I hate you. I hate you. And he'll hate you back. There is no kindness in hell. No, there is no love there. 
Nobody ever smiles there. Nobody ever grins there. Nobody ever tells a joke there. Hell is a place of hatred and sorrow and pain. And I want to tell you, that's a sad way to spend eternity. Well, preacher, I don't know if I believe you or not. Well, you better check up, friend. Because eternity is too long to be wrong. And so these are the saddest words Jesus ever said. They're not heartwarming words. They're not encouraging words. They're not life-giving words. They're sad words. A sad way to live, to live without faith. A sad way to die, to die in your sin. And a sad way to spend eternity in hell where he is not. He's not. But I close with some good news. You don't have to live in unbelief. You can say, Lord Jesus, I make this choice. I choose to believe in you. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you were buried in a tomb, just like the Bible says. And I believe on that third day you rose from the dead. And I believe you're alive. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and save me. You don't have to live without faith. You can trust Jesus. And you don't have to die in your sins. You can die in the sweetness of the forgiveness of God. And you don't have to spend eternity in hell. You don't have to do that. Somebody asked me, Brother Bob, has anybody ever told you to go to hell? Yeah, but I'm not going. <laughs> I've made arrangements to miss, amen? I'm not going. And you don't have to go either. Everybody in hell is there by their own choice. And everybody in hell wishes they had never gone. Would you bow your heads, please? <clears throat> now, Father, we come to the last night of this meeting. Lord, you've blessed us in so many ways. We've seen lots of decisions. And now, Lord, this is the last night. We're not going to come back now tomorrow night and run at this again. Lord, this is it. This meeting is fixing to go into history. Lord, there's some here tonight who've never been saved. In a crowd this size, I just know there's some who've never been saved. And Lord, there may be some like those Pharisees. They, they, they religious. They even may be a member of a church somewhere. Maybe even this church. But deep down they know, they know they've never been saved. They don't have a relationship with you. They just don't know you. And I pray that tonight they would come and take Pastor Wilton by the hand and say, Pastor, I want to be saved tonight. I want to be saved tonight. Lord, maybe there's a man here who came because his family begged him to come. Lord, maybe there's a lady here because her neighbor begged her to come. Maybe there's a teenager here because his friend just begged him to come or her to come with him. And they've never been saved. And God, if, uh, if they choose to live in unbelief, then God, I've shared with them the results of that. And Lord, if they choose to die in their sins, God, I've told them tonight what that means. And if they choose to spend eternity in hell, God, I've shared with them the horrors of that. And so they won't have any excuse. They won't have any recourse. But Lord, I pray if there are some here tonight, men, women, young people, boys, girls, who've never been saved, that they would... Think about these sad, sad words of the Son of God and that they would make the right choice, the choice to believe and receive Jesus into their life. 
Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you've never been saved, you know, you know that. I don't have to convince you of it. Nobody else has to convince If you've never been saved, you know you've never been saved. You may be a church member, but even if you're a church member, if you've never been saved, you know you've never been saved. Jesus cannot be in your life and you not know he's in your life. So if you don't know him tonight, if you've never been saved, why don't you right there where you are, ask him to forgive you of all your sin? Just say something like this, and you don't have to say it out loud, but just talk from your heart to him. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a lost sinner. But I want to be saved. I don't want to go to hell when I die. I don't want to live in unbelief. I don't want to die in my sin. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. I believe in that precious blood that was shed at the cross. I believe you paid the price for my sin. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me tonight. Lord, just save me right now. Save me, Lord Jesus. All that I am, I give to you. Now our heads are bowed, our eyes are done. If you just did that, if you've never done that before, <coughs> but if you just did that and you meant it, then God just saved you. He just saved you. You say, well, Brother Bob, I don't hear any bells ringing. You don't have to hear any bells ringing. I don't hear any thunder rolling. You don't have to hear any thunder rolling. It's a matter of faith. If you chose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died on the cross for you and you ask Him to forgive you of your sin and come into your life, then He did that. He did that. He did that tonight. In a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to have our hymn of invitation. And the pastor is going to be standing here at the front. And if you've given your heart to Jesus tonight, I hope you'll step out and come and just take him by the hand and say, Pastor, tonight I'm giving my life to Jesus. Lord, I've done my very best now on this closing night to make this very simple and very clear. And I pray that people would have listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit and that they would come tonight and trust Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. We stand together. We sing our hymn. You come right now, will you? <coughs>